Hello and welcome to Implus workshop number six. This is Janice Cookin. In this workshop, I will demonstrate important details of how to perform and interpret the techniques of exploratory factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, and structural equation modeling in Implus. These topics encompass a great deal of content and could take up several semesters of graduate study. The goal here is to touch upon some key points in the techniques and then to demonstrate how to use each one of these in M+. Now my PhD is in measurements, so um, I just want to give you a warning. I'm going to be tempted to go into a lot of detail on this topic. EFA and CFA support the development and validation of a scale useful in research. Um, as stated in the standards, for educational and psychological testing. Um, well, I'm just gonna read the first sentence of the book. Educational and psychological testing and assessment are among the most important contributions of cognitive and behavioral sciences to our society, providing fundamental and significant so sources of information about individuals and groups. When we use the words testing or assessment, we often think of achievement tests. But these standards apply not just to achievement tests, but also to instruments, scales, and inventories. The type of scales that we use, many of us use in our research. So one of the most important messages I can relay here is that establishing the validity of the instrument you intend to use for your research is one of the fundamental considerations of your research. The development, scoring, and interpretation of the test for the specific application for the specific population, and for the specific interpretation. All of these things need to be examined to be sure the test is valid. Of course, scale reliability is a key component of establishing validity, because if the scale you develop does not measure the construct consistently across individuals, across time, across demographic groups, the scale cannot be used and is not suitable for research or evaluation. Measurement is exceedingly important to establishing validity. You need to start with a well-constructed and well-validated instrument or the quality of your research is in question. But this workshop needs to focus um, on these techniques in M+. EFA, exploratory factor analysis, CFA, confirmatory factor analysis, and SEM, structural equation modeling. Some of the related techniques will be useful when you have multi-item instruments that measure your construct of interest. You might also want to use these instruments to measure levels of the construct, but you'll need to validate them first. And you might also want to develop models to represent the relationships among constructs and populations and samples in a structural equation model. I recommend these three resources. Actually, there's the fourth one. One is statmodel.com, which is the M plus website. But uh, the other three are really good for uh, learning about the theory and process of instrument validation and factor analysis. I also recommend you read materials on experts in the field of validity, such as Michael Kane, Samuel Mesick, or Danny Borsboom. I also recommend you go to the National Council of Measurement and Education website to learn more about the techniques for establishing reliability and validity. So you're probably wondering, why do we need to be so concerned about these scales and instruments we use in our research? It's pretty easy to write survey items and set them up with a Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. How is this hard? Well, the challenge comes because we are working with states and traits that are not directly observable or measurable. They are called latent traits. And when we operationalize them, they're called latent variables. So as I mentioned, they cannot be directly measured or directly observed. So what are some examples? Self-efficacy, anxiety, depression, psychopathy. Examples of targeted constructs might be teacher self-efficacy. So student, it couldn't be maybe just student self-efficacy or personal self-efficacy, but something very specific. We write these instruments that are very specific, specific and targeted to our application. So patient, health brief, social emotional health, motivation, growth theory of learning, performance approach, achievement goals. Um, but we also have, uh, there's, there's a whole 
science and a whole discipline of uh, psychometricians that work with uh, cognitive ability examples. So classroom tests, state achievement tests, tests like the SAT and the ACT. So in social sciences, we talk about theories, states, traits, attitudes, and beliefs in a way that indicate our belief that they are distinct from one another. But how do we know they're distinct? Why do we think self-efficacy is different from self-esteem? And how are they related? Well, they're probably very highly correlated, but they're not the same. How are they related to other more latent traits? Is it, I don't mean that as more latent or less latent. Um, so I apologize for that wording there. Is it valid to measure the effectiveness of an intervention by a, a particular scale? So I have, a, I have an intervention, I'm going to write a scale. I think that scale is going to be able to measure change. So the ability to measure change is another important feature of scales. And you, we can't really take it for granted that the scale will be effective in measuring change in a construct. So what makes a latent trait latent? Well, you cannot directly measure it, like you can height, weight, count, temperature, etc. So you have to measure it using observation or self-reported data. And a lot of times we develop these inventories. We either, you know, respond to questions ourselves about our own experiences, or maybe we observe as a teacher might have a self-report or a teacher report instrument to um, analyze their students. In either case, a set of items that together establish the domain of the construct are used. And there's a science behind developing and validating these items. A lot of times it includes a pretty much of a mixed method research style uh, that provides the tools for validation. The quantitative side of this is represented by exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis. And then structural equation modeling applies these methods and inference to hypotheses with latent variables. But it's not the only method that does. IRT is one as well. Well, here is an example. This is called the motivational and self-regulated learning components of classroom academic performance. And I'm just pulled two items out of the four, each of the four scales. So these would be, I think this is a five uh, response Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. So self-efficacy would be compared with other students in this class, I expect to do well. Intrinsic value, I like what I'm learning in this class. So you can see that those are going to measure different types of attitudes and values and, and uh, affective traits. Here are two others, cognitive strategies. When studying, I copy my notes over to help me remember material. Self-regulation, I ask myself questions to make sure I know the material I have been studying. I picked up this because um, this is being used um, to measure uh, student ability and student change based on an intervention. I saw a big report uh, recently, and um, and uh, this was a report of an intervention study that was through the IES, funded by the IES. Um, so this particular uh, instrument was validated back in 1990, and it was included in a study that was published in 2019. So uh, once the instrument is validated, it can be, and it often, often is, used many times. So let's start to look at some of the specific uh, techniques within validation. The first step would be to um, run an exploratory factor analysis. So after you've developed a set of items, which you call items, indicators, or response variables that describe some aspect of the latent trait, you don't really know how the responses on these items compare to each other and or to responses on items from the related constructs. So the goal of exploratory factor analysis is, is to identify groups of items for which response patterns are similar to create a more parsimonious set of factors. So you have to collect a sample. So you actually uh, administer your scales or your, your instrument to a group of people and you conduct a factor analysis. Um, and EFA consists of a set of steps to identify the factor structure. Um, and one of the 
the publications I recommended was this PET, Lackey, and Sullivan. So a basic assumption of EFA is that within a collection of observed variables, there exists a set of underlying factors, these latent variables or latent factors. They're smaller in number uh, than the observed variables, and they can explain the interrelationships among these factors. There are several techniques that you could use. Principal components analysis has been used a lot historically, but it's mostly a dimension reduction technique. It's not recommended for most social science research. The principal axis factoring which is the EFA approach, and that is much more recommended. Um, you might want to add, you'll, you'll have to make the decision on whether or not to rotate the solution. And uh, the result of this process uh, is to identify a hypothesized measurement model. So here are some steps. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but basically this is the these are the techniques that you need to do. And we'll go through them in the process of running an EFA. Now, a CFA starts with the measurement model that you have identified in EFA or someone else has published. And that's your a priori model structure. So then you collect data and you then for the basically for the sample that you or the population that you have interest in and you test the structure. You test whether the model fits your data well. And then you might also want to test for invariance. There's a invariance is a field <laughs> within validity all of its own. You might want to test for things like method effects. Um, and it's also necessary to determine if the scale you have has psychometric properties necessary to use in research and assessment. So things like calculating the reliability of your scales and providing evidence of a convergent and valid a discriminant validity. Here's an example of a measurement model. So that's kind of the direction you're going. This is from a publication of mine where I studied uh, mathematical resilience. I have two, three factors, value, struggle, and growth. And this is the diagram that was from my publication. And this shows the correlations between the factors. And these are the factor loadings of the 24 items that were in my scale. If I were to use this in a structural equation model, I would also need to have some sort of uh, other measurement and maybe a theory that said that value, struggle, and growth contribute to uh, some other factor or some other measurement. One of the questions I get asked a lot is how to uh, calculate my factor score. Well, many researchers use the average of the items and then they just use a straight regression. This assumes that all the items have the same factor lo loading, which is the regression weight. And that's really the case. So the most accurate approach is to include all the scale scores in a, I should say, all the item scores of your scale in a measurement model within a structural equation to test your regression. So a structural equation model tests whether the sample variance covariance matrix is similar to that of the implied model using the measurement model and the structural model. Structural models must reflect the th uh, some theory, and they must be tested to see if the theoretical model fits the data structure. The, the process includes model specification and identification first, followed by estimation, testing, and modification. Here is an example. The circles or ellipses are the latent variables. The squares are the observed variables. These are the loadings. So this latent variable is, uh, de is uh, determined by these two uh, observed variables. And actually, the way that I just said that is incorrect because the latent variable defines how people respond on these two variables. This latent variable defines how do they respond on those three. These are exogenous. These two are endogenous, but they are also uh, predicted. Uh, each of these latent variables predicts a set of indicators. And then these arrows, we re re probably remember from our path diagrams, reflect a, a regression uh, structure that this model can be tested to see if the data uh, fits this model. Slide 20 represents a glimpse into the world of latent variables. In our situation, we have continuous observed variables, observed variables, response variables, items. Those all, uh, we often is called, they're called manifest variables also. So any of those terms means what, the, uh, you have an item, you ask someone to consider it and to give you a score, and that score becomes a data value for that particular variable. 
But you might, um, and we also have, uh, we're talking about continuous latent variables. But you might also have categorical response er variables and categorical latent variables. In this case that we're working on now, we're talking about factor analysis. But you see that there are other techniques such as item response theory, latent profile analysis, and latent class analysis. So this is just a reminder that you should not ignore the measurement level of your variables. You will greatly enhance the quality of your work by using proper modeling techniques to support your research questions. In this uh, workshop, we're going to run through three demos uh, in EFA using a data set called WISC, a CFA using a data set called Motivate, and an SEM using a data set called MCINT. Um, each of these are going to be pretty lengthy, so I decided just to do one of each. As always, you, uh, I'm here for your support um, to help you with your work, so please let me know how I can help you. All right, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Now it's time to run M plus.